QuickBooks Online Balance Sheet Report Overview. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. We're going to be using the free QuickBooks Online test drive, searching in our online search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive, selecting the option that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. And then we're going to pick the United States version and verify that we're not a robot. Zooming in a bit by holding down control up on the scroll wheel currently at 125% on the zoom in. Noting in the cog drop down we're currently in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We'll try to toggle back and forth between the two views to get a look at them both. Gonna then open up some tabs or duplicate tabs to put reports in as we do every time. Right click in the tab up top to duplicate. Right click in the duplicated tab to duplicate. Going back to the tab to the left and the reports on the left, opening up the balance sheet report as that's thinking tab to the right, then back down to the tab to the left for the reports and the P&L is what we want here, the profit and loss. Close the hamburger, the ham boogie, otherwise known as, and range change. We're going to be going from 01, 01, 22, tab 12, 31, 22, tab, and we want to run it because we want to refresh it. And then we're going to tab to the left and close up the ham buggy and rangings a changings. We're going to go from a 10122 tab 123122 tab and run it to refresh it. That's the setup process that we do every time. Now we're going to be focused this time on the balance sheet specifically, noting that these are our major two financial statement reports and all other reports relate to them. These are the things that we are constructing when we do the data input. This is part of the major job of the accounting department of the bookkeeping, facilitating the data input with the use of these forms to make the financial transactions to construct the balance sheet and the income statement, which we need for small businesses, at least for taxes, if not for external reporting and internal uh, usage as well for future decision and planning and budgeting. So it's useful then to see how these are being constructed. What, what's the building blocks of the balance sheet and what are the components of it? So to do this, we're also gonna compare, if I go back to the tab to the left, to the chart of accounts, which is down here in our accounting. And then we're gonna go into, I'm just gonna say, see the chart of accounts. There's our chart of accounts and close this up. Now, as we looked at the chart of accounts, we kind of did some of this comparison, but it's useful to now look at it from the balance sheet side as well. So if I go back to the balance sheet, let's start out. I'm gonna hold control and scroll up a bit. We're at 175. I'm gonna zoom, I'm gonna uh, collapse everything from the inside out. So all the triangles, I'm gonna collapse the triangles and then collapse the triangle and then collapse the triangle and then collapse the current assets and then collapse the trucks and then collapse the fixed assets and then collapse the total assets. And it will open this up one at a time. Like we're having uh, one of those toys that have a little thing inside of it and it's always the same thing inside and then we get, we'll open it that way. That wasn't a very good explanation, but you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. So then we're going to close the equity and there we have it. And then we could close liabilities and equity. So this is the, e the, the most condensed format of the balance sheet, which of course is simply the accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities and equity. Now note, it's useful just to see here that assets represent what the company has. The reason the company has it, you can think of assets as in other words, investments because the reason they're in the business is because you're gonna use them in the future to generate revenue. If they weren't being used or weren't planned to be used in the future to generate revenue, then we wouldn't be having them in the business account. We would be putting them to the owner, 
in the form of a draw or dividend so the owner can put it to work somehow possibly investing somewhere else in like stocks and bonds. So remember that one of the principal things we want to keep in mind, even if this is a sole proprietorship, is the business is separate from your personal books and that's going to help you to kind of uh, plan for the business in particular. Now note that you can use QuickBooks for your personal books as well. It's just that then the assets represent you know, what you own and the goal is a little bit different because now the goal isn't revenue generation as it is with the business. The goal is to live well. So, so you still have assets, liabilities, and equity, or you call equity different something, but you, and you can use QuickBooks, but just note it's a little different because when you think of the business as being separate than the personal, the business has a specific goal, revenue generation, which makes it easier in some cases to think about how everything gets put together. Okay, so then the liabilities and equity represent who has claim to the assets. How are you financing the assets that you're going to use to generate revenue in the future? Either you've got a loan, you owe third party people, or you have accounts payable or whatever, or it's financed through you, through equity. Equity representing your value in the business. Assets minus liabilities also equals equity. That's the amount that you could draw out theoretically if you wanted to. Uh, within the business but doing so would be drawing out the assets which <laughs> which you might need of course some of those in order to generate revenue in the future all right so then as we go through here notice that some of the terms we look at when we look at the balance sheet will be financial terms for external reporting purposes standard financial terminology some of them will be specific to quickbooks themselves and we'll try to make some distinctions between those terms also note that the balance sheet is as of a point in time so meaning uh, it's different than the income statement, which has a time range. So if you were to say the financial statements for the year ended December 31st, then the balance sheet is still as of a point in time. If I change the date range up top and I make this from 11, like if I see my numbers down here and I, and I change this to 11, 01, 22 to 12, 31, I didn't change the end date. And therefore there's, there's no change on you know, the bottom line, I had it, it, un, it undid the whole thing, but there shouldn't be any change on the bottom line, 23, uh, 4, 36, 29. And if I change this back to January 01, 01, 22, and run it, and we look down here, we've got 23, 4, 36, 29. So I'm gonna go ahead and collapse all these again. Okay, I've collapsed them now. So that's important to note because the, the income statement is different the income statement is going to be your timing report and it's going to show you how far you went in a current time range. So you can think of it how far you drove your car, how many miles you drove your car in a month. If you want to start over and see how many miles you drove, you got to reset the odometer or set it. That's your beginning point, whatever it is, and see how far you went from that point. That's how the income statement is. The balance sheet tells you where you stand after you drove the car to wherever you drove it. That's where you are at this point in time. Okay, so if I open up my assets, then we've got the fixed assets and we've got the current assets. These are financial terms, or, or at least the, the current assets is a standard financial category term representing that the assets that you owe, uh, that you own, that you're going to use fairly shortly, typically like in a year in order to help you to generate revenue. So if I open up the current assets, then we've got the bank accounts, accounts receivable, other current assets. Note that these are not standard like separate groups. We don't typically in financial reporting have another subcategory oftentimes for cash. You could, but you don't often because these are all just part of current assets. The reason we break out the bank accounts and the accounts receivable as we discussed, if I jump back on over to the chart of accounts is because they have special characteristics in the chart of accounts. So on the balance sheet, these the little carrots for the bank accounts and the accounts receivable and other current assets are driven by the account types. That's how it's being built. So if I go back on over here, the bank accounts, remember, is not exactly what you would expect in a financial reporting financial statement. You would expect cash and cash equivalents. So you have a slight difference in the reporting because from a bookkeeping standpoint, we want to know the checking accounts because they have a special need and that they could be connected to the banks, for example. And then you've got another subcategory, which you might not always have in normal reporting. Accounts receivable, same thing. You've got a subcategory in financial reporting. You might just call it a component of current assets. Now it's got its own little breakout. 
and another subtotal, which is quite redundant if you only have one account in there. Although you could have another one like allowance for doubtful accounts. But that's, uh, that's why that's broken out here. Accounts receivable is an account that's gonna be going up with invoices. It's only gonna be there if you have an accrual uh, kind of component. So you'll notice the checking accounts, of course, will be there whether you're on a cash basis or not. The accounts receivables are only going to be there if you are using a accrual basis. And as we go through this, it might be useful just to note that the checking account, if you go into it, then is going to have most way more data than any other account, meaning the, the types of transactions and the quantity of them will be much more variant and lengthier than other accounts. If I go back to my report and I go into the accounts receivable, you can see that this account only goes up with invoices and then it goes down when we pay uh when the invoices are paid by customers so so uh, we, sh we should start to get a feel for each of these accounts and which forms are going to increase and decrease them and that'll give us a way better understanding of what's going on all right so then obviously it, it expanded everything again every time i go into an account so i'm going to collapse everything now the next one we're on is other current assets so these are current assets that don't have a special need so that's why they, they're they're here in their own group all of these for financial reporting would just be current assets but now these don't have a special need so they put them down here you've got the inventory assets these are going to go up when you buy the inventory down when you make a sale of the inventory uh and it would only be there of course if you're tracking inventory it is an accrual account because inventory if you're tracking it on the balance sheet means that you're you're doing an accrual thing you're putting it on the balance sheet you're not expensing it when you pay for it but rather when you consume it to generate revenue so these two accounts are in essence accrual accounts you've got undeposited funds which is basically a cash account you would think for normal reporting purposes it would be up here in the in the cash and cash equivalents but because this isn't cash and cash equivalents it's a bank account that usually has the type of accounts that connect to the bank statement they don't put it up here they put it down here which is a little kind of annoying but it should be a clearing account that closes out to zero so it shouldn't have much in it at any given time so it shouldn't be uh, too bad it has a special need because this is the account that is going to be helping you out to make a deposit uh into the into the checking account so if i went into my deposit form over here these items here are are tying out to the undeposited funds so so that's why it has its own kind of it has a kind of a special characteristic even though it doesn't have its own category back to the balance sheet and once again it expanded everything so i'll i'll unexpand them no it didn't expand everything i'm just down here on the fixed assets now fixed assets could be called property plants and equipment oftentimes i think would be more common in financial reporting you might think of them as depreciable assets if you go into here you've got your truck now truck is it normally like what you might call your fixed assets? And you wanna be careful with the fixed assets because oftentimes you're not gonna, you're gonna to have to depreciate them. It's an accrual account, but it's an accrual account, meaning if you're on a cash-based system, you wouldn't have fixed assets. You wouldn't have depreciable assets. But even if you're on a cash basis, you still do have depreciable assets from a practical sense, because even if you're just doing your taxes, you're reporting for taxes, you're gonna to have to have you're gonna to have to deviate from a cash-based system for fixed assets on and depreciate at least on a tax-based system so you can't get away from it even if you're a small business generally and so and so you're gonna to have to track these fixed assets now you, you typically are gonna to have to do that at least on a tax-based system and oftentimes small businesses will use tax software to do that so i would strongly advise then you discuss with your your tax accountant how you're going to be dealing with the fixed assets and if they provide the depreciation schedules, you want to line up your fixed assets to, to line up to the depreciation schedules that they can give you. Oftentimes, tax software for being able to give you depreciation schedules on both a tax basis and a book basis if you want, uh, if you want that. So, so uh, we'll talk more about that later, but that's going to be the fixed assets. Now, note it's important to break out the fixed assets from the current assets because fixed assets are kind of like the kind of things that you're investing in oftentimes to generate revenue. Now, if you're in a small business and you just do gig work or something, then you might not have a lot of fixed assets, but you're often in a business that also has a lot of competition in it. If you're in a kind of business where, you're, where you have to buy equipment, 
then the whole goal is, well, I've got to, I've got to generate capital so that I can money so that I can put that money into fixed assets like farm equipment or something like that so that I can then make money with the fixed assets. So that's the whole process, but you got to be careful because if you have all of your money in the fixed assets, you don't have enough money to finance your your future upcoming payments, your your current liabilities that are coming due. You want to be liquid enough to meet the future needs while still putting in a lot of your money into the fixed assets if that's how you're generating money because that's how you're generating money. All right, so then that's going to give us our our total fixed assets here and then we've got our total assets then. So that gives us our total assets, that's what we own. Clearly the the things that we own are not all in dollars. So we have 23 436 29 uh, dollars worth of stuff. We have to measure in dollars. So and that's again important to note because you can't have all your money in the fixed assets because it's not liquid. Although you have assets that can cover a problem in the future, it's not easy to access them. That's the point. All right, so then you got your liabilities and equity. So liabilities represent third party that owe that you owe money to. And once again, we've got current versus long term. Current liabilities are kind of arbitrarily defined as they're due within one year. But it's important to, to have that breakout because these are the things that are going to be coming due soon. And that's why you want to compare these to your current assets, because the current assets hopefully will be converted into cash soon, meaning or possibly even your, your quick assets or whatever your accounts receivable and your cash. That's what you're going to have in order to pay the current liabilities. That's why we often have a comparison between the current assets and the current liabilities. Now, within current assets, you've got these different breakouts of accounts payable, credit cards and other current uh, liabilities. Uh, now, now the reason you in financial reporting, you wouldn't typically have that. They would just be current liabilities. But in QuickBooks, accounts payable like accounts receivable has a special need. It's, it's basically got an, its own account type, as we can see over here in the in the GL. So if I scroll down to accounts payable here, it's got its own account type. And that's why it's got its own like triangle, even though there's only one account in it, it looks funny, it looks quite redundant, it takes up a lot of space that's kind of needlessly done because it's only one account. But it's done so because every account type has its own account. It's special has its own account because we need to track who owes us the money, which is going to be by vendor. Now notice accounts payable uh, is an accrual account as well. You wouldn't have accounts payable unless you were on an accrual basis for your outflows, your expenses. If you're just paying your bills when they become due and you're not entering, entering the bill, but in, you're paying them off with an expense form, you're paying your bills with an expense or check form, an electronic transfer, then you're not going to have an accounts payable. It's only when you enter a bill into the system, a bill form, that you'll have an increase to the accounts payable. So the accounts payable goes up with a bill form and it goes down when you pay the bill. So then we've got the credit cards. Now the credit cards are broken out into their own account because they are kind of like a checking account. So meaning you could pay all of your expenses in essence out of instead of electronic transfers from the bank, you could then pay them with a credit card and then just pay off the credit card monthly or something like that. And that means that if you were to do that, you would have a whole lot of transactions within the credit card, which would be similar to the banking transactions, right? Because, because at least on the decreasing side of things, not on the deposit side of things. Uh, so, so, uh, you, and so it has its special account because you can connect it to the bank in a similar way as, or not to the bank, but to the financial institution, which might also be your bank in a similar way as the checking accounts. That's why it's got its own breakout here because it's got a special need within QuickBooks, which you wouldn't see in normal financial reporting. And then every other current liability account that doesn't have that special need is down here, including here we've got the uh, the sales tax payable, which are gonna be set up by QuickBooks when you you set up your sales tax, when you turn on your sales tax, and then you've got a loan payable which might be there when you take out, say, a loan uh, from the bank and you might pay them off in installments and so on. So the loan would go up when you when you take out the loan and down when you make your installment payments. And then the sales tax accounts are going to go up whenever you make a sale 
like an invoice with an invoice or sales receipt because you're charging the customer for uh, sale, their tax, sales tax, and they're gonna go down when you pay the tax with a special payment widget, right, to the government. It'll be like a, a payment form, but it'll have its own, its own number or its own type because uh, you're using the QuickBooks system to make the payment. And then you got long-term liabilities. Usually you don't have a lot of these possibly, could depend on the type of business, but the type of thing you'll have down here is your loans typically. So if you have a loan that is extending over a year, then it's not current, but it's long-term. And so you've got a, you have a, a situation with these loans too, that's kind of a, an issue in that if you take out a business loan, the loan, you might be paying back the loan in monthly installments over five years. What if that's the case? Well, then you have a current portion of the loan that you're going to pay back in one year, and you've got a long-term portion you're going to pay back after one year. Okay, so then I can just break them out between the two. But the, the problem is that I, it's not easy to do that because every time I make a payment, then I'm going to have to make the adjustment between the short term and the long term every time I make a payment. That becomes tedious. So, so oftentimes, uh, you, when we're in practice, you might have like one loan account, maybe like you put the whole loan in the current loan, and then periodically at the end of the month, we'll make an adjusting entry to break out the current portion and the long term portion for reporting purposes needs. Now, it's important for reporting purposes needs that you know the difference between the current and long term portion. Because again, you want to make sure that you're liquid, you want to make sure that you have current liabilities that are are somewhat in the range that you can pay them off with your current or liquid assets. Right, so if you <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, uh, you're in danger of, of going bankrupt, right? You're not gonna have so one way to avoid going bankrupt is to extend the loans to to have less in the current portion and more in the long term portion, right? So that you can hopefully have more time to make money, have your master plan play itself out so that you can become a billionaire before <laughs> before you run out of cash and they won't let you get so there's also some issues with the loans that we'll talk about in terms of reporting if you have multiple loans like some construction companies do for example uh, as you're financing equipment and whatnot then then the question is uh, for reporting purposes you really only want one loan payable for external reporting but for internal reporting you probably want a different loan payable for each loan so that you can tie out the loan to the amortization table. And then you want to have periodic adjustments at the end of the year with multiple long term loans. So you can break them out between short term and long term and be able to verify that they are correct. So we might use like sub accounts in order to do that. We'll talk more about that uh, when we get into uh, the bookkeeping reporting side of things. But there's some differences between external reporting and internal reporting. And a lot of times you might do some stuff within QuickBooks to make it easier to do the bookkeeping while still being able to make adjustments for external reporting uh, as needed. So possibly with end of period adjusting entries and with sub accounts and things like that. So we'll talk more about that as we get into uh, the practice problems. You also have an issue that you have to break out interest uh, and principal when you make the loan payments and the interest and the principal will differ with every loan payment. So that also causes an issue when you're trying to automate and make the, the system as easy as possible. We'll talk about all those issues as we go through the, our practice problem area. And then that gives us our liabilities. And then you've got your, your equity. Now the equity as one lump sum, uh, you can think of, notice they gave us a nice generic term of equity because uh, it can be thought of as in essence the same no matter what type of entity you are. In other words, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, S Corp, LLC, whatever. But th but then within equity, we'll have to break it out. So equity, you can think of as total assets, 23436.29 minus the liabilities, meaning the claims to those assets from third party, that's gonna be 25000. That gives us our, our uh, equity. Hold on a second. Something went wrong. That wasn't total liabilities. Let's say plus 25000 minus, I should have picked up this number, 31131.33. That gives us our equity. So we're negative equity in this, in this instance. So that's not really good. But that's going to be the idea. That would be like the book value 
uh, of the company, when you're trying to value the company, the first thing you're probably going to look at is, well, okay, what's your equity? What's your assets? What's minus your liabilities? Now, within equity, it's going to the accounts will differ depending on the type of of company or or business you are. The opening balance equity. This is kind of like the uh, the default account that QuickBooks will put in place if you do a transaction where QuickBooks doesn't know where the other side should, would go. Meaning oftentimes when you put the beginning balances in, we'll see this when we start a new company file, it'll put the other side to opening balance equity. It's actually a really good system, but opening balance equity is not a professional account. You don't wanna keep it in opening balance equity because when you report to someone else and you have a balance in opening balance equity, it looks unprofessional. So you wanna move it out of there typically. And then you've got retained earnings. Now retained earnings is a name that is usually applicable to a, a, a corporation. A corporations, we would call it retained earnings. So th there's gonna be differences in the names. Now, first of all, just note that this retained earnings, whatever you call it, is gonna be for QuickBooks an important account because QuickBooks will close out your income statement into retained earnings or whatever you want to call this account if you want to change the name every year every fiscal year that you have on it so this so notice that this number right here 164246 represents what's on the balance on the profit and loss that's how the income statement is related to the balance sheet and then if i was to change the date up top it'll move it so if i go if i change the date to 2023 2023 and i run it QuickBooks is trying to help us out by closing it, by showing us what the income is and then closing it out to retained earnings. Now that's kind of neat that it does that. It's great that it does a closing process, but the fact that it includes income down here can also cause some issues. And let's just discuss that real quick here. If I go back up top and I bring it back to 2022 and 2022, let's say 123122 and run it to refresh it. So, so, so let's say that this was a sole proprietorship, for example, if it was a sole proprietorship, you might call this uh, owner's equity, or maybe your capital account. And then you also might have another account for draws. That's the amount that, of money that you take out of the business as you earn revenue in the business. If you're not putting it back in the business as property, plant, and equipment up top, if you're not buying property, plants, and equipment, and it's not giving you any added value, you're just holding on to it in the checking account, then typically you want to give it to yourself in the form of draws. So the draws would be the money coming out. And then you also might be putting more money in, which you might just put directly into the retained earnings account, or you might have another account called owner investments or something like that. That's the money that you're taking out of your personal account to put into the business, most likely to buy property, plants, and equipment or something like that to generate revenue in the future. So if it was a corporation, then you call, you call this retained earnings. That's the earnings that have accumulated over time that you haven't yet given back out to the owners. The money that you give to the owners is usually then called dividends. It's different than a draw because if you have multiple shareholders, you can't just, you can't just have one shareholder take out more money than another shareholder. The company itself has to give out equal money to everybody that's why we call it a dividend and therefore you have to you have to have everybody kind of agree you know the company the board of directors and the management have to degree agree on the amount of money that's going to be distributed in dividends so corporations are are kind of they're still fairly easy to think about how to report that's the point of a corporation because you have multiple owners but you're breaking all the ownership into equal units of shares and therefore that actually makes the equity section a little bit easier, although you can get complex stuff like treasuries and all this weird stuff going on. But, but that's actually should make it a little bit easier for reporting for multiple owners than say a partnership. And then in a corporation, you might have the, the, the capital stock represents the money that was invested. So instead of owner investment in a sole proprietorship, you putting money in, you, the money that, that the, is invested by the owners is because the, the corporation issued stocks for money. So the owners put money in when they bought the stocks from the company, not on the secondary market. These are stocks that were issued from the company. And then if it was a partnership, which is actually kind of the most complex component oftentimes, 
then this retained earnings account would be a partner, an equity partner account. Uh, and then you, and then you've got multiple partners, which you might call capital accounts partner. And that would be breaking out total equity. But now instead of breaking it out by retained earnings and investments, which you do for a corporation or just one capital account, you have to have multiple capital accounts because in a partnership, the partners can have different capital accounts depending on the partnership agreement. They can draw different amounts out of the out of the partner. They can have different amounts of income allocated to their accounts. So these would be kind of like the payable accounts to the partners, you can kind of think of it as. And that is where it becomes a problem to have this retained earnings oftentimes down here, or I'm sorry, the net income, because oftentimes the net income needs to roll into retained earnings or a partner capital account so that you can then allocate it to the various partners, right? And in accordance with the partnership agreement. So that becomes a bit tedious. Partnerships actually become more tedious in some ways than a corporation, uh, just in terms of allocating the, 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 the equity out. So, so, so you might have to change the name, but equity in total is pretty straightforward. And then you've got your total liabilities and equity, which represents the same, is the same number as your total assets. They're just two sides of the coin. Assets is what the company has. Liabilities and equity represent who has claim to it, either third parties, the bank, or yourself, the owner, or yourselves, the owners, in the case of a partnership corporation. Okay, so that's the, the balance sheet. So in a future presentation, uh, we'll, we'll kind of go into to formatting the balance sheet and then we'll talk about uh, the, the income statement and how it's related to the balance sheet. Uh, just note, if I go to the first tab, I don't think we did anything special with the COG and changing to the business view. We've just been looking at uh, the chart of accounts is, is here. So the chart of accounts is under bookkeeping and then chart of accounts. And then your reports are under business overview and then your reports. I think that's the only areas we went. Uh, it's just a different layout for the business view.